I'm Peter Block for ACC.org, and uh, this is 2020 TCT, of course, virtual this year. With me are Deepak Bhatt from Boston and Kim Eagle from Michigan. Uh, we've done the last three days, as it is now day four. We have two interesting trials to talk about today, not really trials, uh, sort of trials. Mitral valve interventions for mitral regurgitation, particularly in patients who are sick and possibly even in, sh in shock. And then the whole issue of renal de denervation once again reared its ugly head. Uh, I'm gonna start with you, Deepak, with renal denervation, particularly of accessory renal arteries. Uh, should we should we not go there when we try to denervate arteries? And should we denervate arteries at all? So uh, Deepak, start with that. Absolutely. renal innovation is alive and kicking, first of all, just to make sure everyone knows that. And the most contemporary randomized clinical trial data show a modest but statistically significant effect on blood pressure in sham control trials. So it looks like there's a something there with the latest generation catheters. But the real question is, can we build upon what we've got and get results that would be unequivocally considered robust by referring physicians and by patients and third-party payers and so forth? One hypothesis has been that in people with accessory renal arteries, that denervation of the accessory renal artery may aid in terms of blood pressure control. So that's what this study was addressing. And it did suggest that if accessory renal arteries are sizable by that, I mean, say more than three millimeters or so, that denervating them might provide additional blood pressure reduction. So I think this is something that needs to be tested on a larger scale. But as we refine renal artery denervation, this is something that will need to be considered. Right now, there are trials going on looking at more distal branches of main renal arteries. And this is yet another approach, getting at the accessory renal artery. So I think over the course of years, we'll be able to refine the technique and hopefully have a much more robust reduction in blood pressure. Now, this is really a pathology uh, review of the accessory renal arteries. And no surprise, the bigger the arteries, the more the nerves. So if you can knock out more nerves, you might do better with the hypertension. Sort of all makes sense, doesn't it, Deepak? But we need a lot more data before we can say for sure that this is the right way to go. Though, you know, if you have a three and a half or four millimeter accessory artery, seems silly not to at least give it a shot and go for it. All right, we'll have to learn more about this as we go forward, as you point out, and a larger trial is definitely gonna be needed. We just need a lot more data in this whole area. Right. Mitral regurgitation and the sick patient, Kim, uh, should we, should we not go there with the transcatheter uh, attempts to make the mitral regurgitation better? Talk about this trial. Yeah, this is a, a, a labor of love for these investigators. It took almost nine years to accumulate 140 patients who came in with cardiogenic shock complicated by at least moderate to severe MR. Uh, and they were able to show that uh, it was doable. Obviously, when we encounter patients with shock, we now have a lot of options for them, including uh, circulatory support, uh, ECMO, et cetera. But in the patient who has severe MR, where the lungs are flooded, this trial at least gives us uh, some option for treating that percutaneously. These were not thought to be operative candidates, but it's hard to, it's kind of hard to put into context exactly where this technology is going to go as we uh, move into the future. But it, it offers uh, one possible solution for a very rare cohort of patients. I'm gonna to move to you, Deepak. Tell me whether or not this is a good idea. I mean. Transcatheter mitral valve interventions have now proven over the years to be far safer than we thought, right? When I started doing this for the first uh, mitral clip trials way back when, we were, we were thinking this, this can't be benign. And it turns out that getting into the left atrium and playing around with that mitral valve turns out to be not straightforward, but at least safe, safer than we thought. You know, your, work in, your work in this field was really pioneering, and I think time has proven that this is a safe approach. And, and obviously, if one were considering surgery, open heart surgery, and these sorts of sick patients, of course, the outcomes would be really bad, even if you could find someone willing to take such patients to the OR. So I do think, you know, in patients where they're really in extremis, you've got to do something. It, it's uh, an option to consider. 
I, I would though default to what I think has been a bit of a theme at this meeting, that you know, to the extent we can do randomized trials of a lot of these questions, we really should. Of course, it took them a while just to enroll a number of patients here in a non-randomized fashion, but more broadly, I'd say in the topic of cardiogenic shock, that's a big juicy area in cardiology and interventional cardiology and critical care cardiology, where there are a lot of patients very high event rates as in this trial. And therefore, it should be possible to do trials that aren't super large in sample size and can be conducted over a few years. So you know, I, I hope we try to do more in interventional cardiology with randomizing patients, including sick ones, to different technologies instead of just saying, oh, this patient's so sick, we can't enroll them in a trial. Well, correct me if I'm wrong here, Kim, uh, but it looked to me when I looked at these data curves that there was still a, more mortality than you would like at the end of one year. We're up to 35 to 40 percent of bad outcomes in these patients who, of course, are terribly sick to start with. We know cardiogenic shock has perhaps even an even higher mortality if you just treat medically. Uh, what are your thoughts about even doing this? Because there didn't seem to be that much difference between the intervened on groups uh, and those that did not have interventions. Give me some thoughts, yeah. Kim. Yeah, you're right, Peter. The, the, the mortality rate was very high. Obviously, having cardiogenic shock, no matter what you have done for you, is a very bad situation to be in. And I think, uh, I think Deepak's right here, and that is that wouldn't it be great if we had an international cardiogenic shock trialist group which would um, offer solutions that are specific for a patient. Is the RV down, is the LV down, is the mitral valve blown out, is it AR, is it AS? Um, if we become more anatomic in how we approach these patients and study solutions, I think we're gonna make faster progress. Okay, Deepak, you get one last 15 second word. I think Dr. Eagle is always right. I agree with what he said. Okay, well, that's it for day four and five here at TCT Virtual for 2020. I want to appreciate uh, both Deepak and Kim for being part of this. Thanks so much for your insights.